Chair and members of the committee, Ranking Member Womack and others, for uh, providing us this opportunity to address congressional priorities. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that if you see your person's budget, you know what, they're, they're va what they value. And I believe it's time that our budget aligns with the values of the American people and the needs of the American people. Defense spending is, is a, one of the primary areas in our budget. It takes a great deal of it. It's important, no question about it. But we have compelling needs at home that need prioritizing for more funding, even more so than defense. We must deal with, first of all, our own mortality. That's a special interest to each and every one of you, your own mortality. And a lesser included part of that is our health care our health experiences, our health care, and how we deal with that. Uh, secondly, we need to deal with education and educating our populace. Third, get people jobs, and we do that through a good infrastructure program, which we need to fund. Our infrastructure is crippling, and it's important to get goods to market and to help uh, our, our commerce, and, and also to embrace diplomacy. Uh, you know, the, the likelihood that uh, Congress also needs to end the school to prison pipeline, reduce recidivism, end the rape kit backlog, and support people who are getting clean from drugs. And we can do this by supporting programs in commerce, justice, and science. The likelihood of any one of us dying from heart attack or heart disease or stroke or diabetes or Alzheimer's or AIDS or whatever else is, is pretty darn good. The likelihood of us dying from a terrorist attack or in a war involving North Korea, Iran, or anybody else is pretty much nil. I'm not saying we don't need a defense budget, but there's a whole lot of fat in that defense budget. And the real enemy of the American people and of all the people on the globe is disease. And we need to do all we can to fight the disease. That's our real enemy. And the Defense Department against disease is the NIH and the CDC. And the more we can help the NIH and the CDC in doing funding on these catastrophic diseases, the more we are prioritizing what the real enemy is and what our real purpose should be, keeping people healthy and keeping them alive for a longer period of time and keeping their relatives and their loved ones, et cetera, alive too. Uh, we need to maintain our, our safety nets, Medicare, Medicaid, it's part of that health program, and food assistance programs. It also relates well to it. If you don't have a good diet and you don't have an opportunity, you're going to have disease that's going to follow with it. There are 15 million American households, 11.6%, who are food insecure or worse sometime during 2017. That means 40 million people, including 6.5 million children, live in food insecure households. The wealthiest country on earth should not be letting people go to sleep hungry. So we need to support SNAP payments and any other payments we have to see to it that people have a chance to get food. And we try to, should try to eliminate food deserts and see that people can get fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and eat better. Uh, not have a bunch of sodium-filled and carbohydrate-filled fast foods. Congress needs to invest in diplomacy and foreign aid as well. As our great former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis said during testimony before the Senate Armed Forces Committee, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I'll need more ammunition ultimately. So I think it's a cost-benefit ratio. The more we put into the State Department's diplomacy, the less we have to put into the military budget as we deal with the outcome of an apparent American withdrawal from the international scene. Diplomacy and foreign assistance saves service members' lives and saves the United States government money by putting less soldiers in harm's way and doing the right thing to try to head off crises before they occur. I believe it's contrary to our, what our priorities should be when the Department of Defense receives over half of our discretionary spending and every other department and agency has to fight over the scraps of whatever's left. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to here before you and just stress all I can. And I know it's a special interest, special interest to each of you individually and your families and to every one of your constituents to make fighting disease and improving health outcomes the number one priority of our budget because that's what we need to be doing. I uh, urge the committee to do this and I thank you so much for your efforts and your time and I look forward to many, many years from now when Mr. Yarmouth retires and his picture will be up on the wall with Ms. Black, Mr. Ryan, and Mr. Spratt and others. I thank the gentleman very much for his testimony and that comment. Uh, and he, yes, you recognize for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Cohen, uh, just a couple of quick questions. Appreciate you being here, taking the time. We all have busy schedules during the day, so thanks for coming here and addressing the committee. Uh, you outlined some of the issues that you believe are pressing and important and things that we should prioritize as a Congress. Uh, I share your uh, concern about uh, the well-being of the American people and health issues. Uh, 
you know, my dad's a polio survivor, I'm a cancer survivor, you've got hundreds of stories, right, in your family and network, we all do. Um, my question for you is, you described the extent to which there's waste in defense. Would you also agree that there's waste in non-defense discretionary spending? There probably is, but I have not seen as outrageous of reports as the this reports I've seen over the years on defense, whether it's toilet seats on planes or other uh, examples that have been cited and uh, cost overruns on airplanes. Well, I think there, I think there's a significant number of reports that suggest there's waste throughout government. And I would agree with you that there's waste in the Department of Defense, but I would say it's uh, I would suggest it's probably equally uh, so in non-defense discretionary. But here's my question: for any additional spending that you think is necessary for the CDC, you mentioned other healthcare priorities, um, fighting disease, all laudable goals in society. Are you suggesting dollar for dollar cuts out of DoD in order to pay for any increases that you're suggesting there? I am indeed because I think it's our, it's our first line of defense and it's the real enemy. More than, I'm a polio survivor also. Oh. Now, Dr. Salk and Dr. Sabin kind of took care of that and right. the Gates is a nice trio. Sure. But uh, you know, you've got heart disease, stroke, you name it. Mm -hmm. And you just pick up the, obit, the paper any day and look at the obits, <laughs> those are people we lost and they could have been put off. They're gonna be, we're all gonna go eventually, but we can delay it, put it off and, and make it better. And I just think that's our first priority. Okay, I just I just wanted to clarify about what we're talking about here in order to get for, you know because we're sitting we're sitting here looking at a 1.3 uh, trillion dollar deficit right for the this fiscal year and or I'm sorry we're almost a trillion dollars of uh, deficit spending this fiscal year. Um, I'm trying to look out and see well what are we going to do next year in order to control spending, and so that's one option right if if those who want non defense discretionary to go up they say well we want dollar for dollar cuts in defense if we want defense to go up maybe dollar for dollar cuts in non defense discretionary. I guess my question for you is, how do you propose we get a handle on spending and balancing the budget um, uh, going forward if what you just suggested would be to increase non-defense discretionary, do dollar for dollar cuts out of defense, we're still going to be spending a trillion dollars more than we're taking in. So what, what's, how to, what's our way forward when we're staring at $22 trillion of debt? Well, there's a lot of ways, and I think revenue is a major way, and I think a lot of the tax cuts that we just passed were unnecessary, wasteful didn't spur the economy on, it was a short blip, and we ought to put taxes back on the wealthiest, wealthiest people. And, and while you know, what was proposed by one of my freshman colleagues might be a little high, uh, the top rate ought to go up, because people earning over $10 million, over $20 million can and should pay more, and the estate tax never should have been changed, even when the Democrats did it. It should go back to the th level of 3.5 million single exemption and $7 million uh, marital exemption. 60% uh, of the wealth in this country is, is passed through estate shifts by inheritance. People ought to earn that money. You know, Ivanka Trump just said people don't want a handout. They'd rather work and earn their own money. They don't want to be given something. But 60% of the wealth in this country is passed by inheritance. And that's where the estate tax comes in and we could raise so, a lot of money there by putting it back to the right areas where we did and not give uh, so tax you, breaks to the, to the do you lucky think there's club. Do you think there's a trillion dollars of revenue on the table in tax increases? There certainly can be. We had a trillion dollars of deficit created because of tax decreases. So the, so the answer then, what I'm hearing is, uh, increase non-defense discretionary to cut defense to increase taxes to the tune of, of a significant amount of money, upwards of a trillion dollars. That's, that's, that's the suggestion? I, you know, I'm kind of like, I guess, Everett Dirksen, I think it was, and it might have been, you know, a million here and a trillion there, and you've got real money. I don't know, trillions and billions. Mm. It could be billions. I don't want to go with trillions, but whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's money that we gave away in, in the tax cuts, and there's money we gave to a bunch of people who are going to inherit money uh, that they otherwise would not have uh, when we reduce that rate. The rate's the big thing. It's not the exemption level. It's the rate going from 55% down to 35%. That gives the billionaire folks hundreds of millions of dollars to pass on. So la last point. They want it because they want to work. With my time decreasing, I obviously believe that the uh, tax cuts are paid for themselves. I think CBO report has suggested such. I think we've more than paid for the tax uh, cuts that have been uh, put in place to then generate the revenue that we're now seeing with 3% economic growth last year. So I'd obviously respectfully disagree, but I thank you for your time. You're welcome, sir. Expired. General's time has expired. Now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Thank Adams. You.